welcome to a special edition of Views of the News. Normally coming out of our theme music and video open, you would see me and Kathy Kiley and Ernest Perry in our regular weekly roundtable on media behaviors, but not today. Today I've got something a little bit different for you. I've spent this fall semester working with six students from the University of Missouri's Honors College. They are students who are interested in current events, politics, technology, the world of business, and most of all, good storytelling. Some of them are journalism students, some aren't. But what I can tell you is that they are a smart group, they're passionate, and they have a lot to say. Enough from me. Better you hear from them. Here they are. Thanks for that kind introduction, Amy. But before we dive into things, let's start by some quick introductions. I'm Bradley Davis, a sophomore studying broadcast journalism and economics from Wiley, Texas. I'm Olivia Evans, a sophomore studying news reporting journalism and Spanish. I'm Alex Engel, a junior studying broadcast journalism from Houston, Texas. I'm Ann Fitzmorris, a freshman studying journalism strategic communication. I'm Emily Maruzak. I'm a freshman business major with a focus in accountancy. And I'm Lucas Parrish, a freshman studying broadcast journalism. But my classmates can tell you, after this semester, I have a whole new appreciation for documentary journalism, too. <laughs> hey, Stanley Nelson asked for a picture with me. <laughs> <It's very fair>. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> Moving on, we've got a lot to get to today, starting with the launch of Disney+. Plus. It's one of the more than 100 different streaming services available to consumers today. Led by Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Prime, the streaming service industry has exploded over the last decade. Disney Plus isn't even the last one that will be added. There will be in 2020 HBO Max, NBC Universal, and Quibi. Those are the headliners, but streaming services will be added continuously until a market no longer exists. When does it become too much, or has it already reached that point? I think it, it's getting to that point where people are starting to get annoyed because they have to go on each different um, website to find shows they want, but like they go on one, they can't find it, so they have to go on another one. So I think that um, consumers are gonna start to really get annoyed and we're gonna start to hear about it pretty soon if we haven't already. Along those lines, I also think it's fair to say that by seeing all these new streaming services, we're gonna start to see pushback from consumers and we might even see a resurgence of cable news and cable TV because with cable, people can see everything that they want. They don't have to have and pay for the different subscriptions to each and every streaming service. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And what I think is it'll lead to a new industry and a new look for cable TV. Instead of having individual streaming services and cable, I think TV networks will start having packages where they'll have, you know, for this package, you get this many streaming sites, you know, uh, Netflix, Disney Plus, that sort of thing. And they'll even have um, work out deals with these streaming companies to have base packages. You know, you get some of Disney Plus with this much money, some with this money. So it kind of bundles it all. So you pay like one price, you get a bundled amount, almost going back to how cable used to be, except now with these streaming services, because there's so many of them, I really don't think they're going away anytime soon. There's no, like Disney Plus just came out, there's no way it's going bankrupt in the next few years. Like it's going to be here to stay. So I think cable companies will just adapt to it and it'll create a new industry. For sure, yeah, that's an interesting point, Bradley. So you think that cable TV is almost going to come into the 21st century kind of and right. start to start to make these deals with these different streaming services anymore to get all of these streaming services, you know, to be able to watch all the shows you want to watch, you're going to be paying the same, if not more than for cable news. So yeah, you could definitely see a cable resurgence in the coming future. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would also argue that big companies like Netflix, Disney Plus, all those, they have monopolies over smaller shows produced by smaller companies. Mm -hmm. So that might lead to like, kind of a weird competition over what shows are going to be on what platform. Along those lines, I would actually disagree a little. I think we're going to see the end of Netflix in the coming um, days. Netflix is actually bankrupt at this point, so it will be ending very soon. And um, with Disney Plus um, bundling with Hulu and ESPN Plus, Netflix just can't compete with that conglomerate anymore. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that Netflix, since it doesn't have it, like, it's getting the original movies and stuff, but I think the um, established places like NBC and Disney are going to have more of a future um, with the streaming services. And I think you have to watch out too because you have to watch out for the quality because if you're trying to fit this market so much, you're going to start mass producing. And if all of these streaming services just start making everything of their own to like try to get that, you might not get the best quality of everything, which you're paying for. So you got to watch out for that too. I think we're already kind of seeing that with Netflix and their original mm -hmm. movies and the TV shows that they already have on there. Like, people are going to Disney Plus, people are going to watch, like, their old favorite Disney shows instead of some Netflix original that they don't really care about because they like that nostalgia and they like those TV shows that they, like, 
have known for a long time instead of something that they have to search for hours for to find something good to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, now that those shows are getting pulled from Netflix, they're trying to make up for it with their own content. But as you mentioned, Olivia, they're going bankrupt and so they don't really have the resources. So I agree with you. I think we could see an end to Netflix, maybe even just entirely an end to Netflix in the coming future. I don't know. I don't think it's going to go away. I, I know they're bankrupt. I bet they're going to get bought out by a bigger company, probably Disney. And one thing I noticed is um, I like the show Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I was really sad because I thought it was going to go off air and it's still on there. So maybe that's a sign that um, Disney's going to be buying them out sometime soon. All right, and on to our next topic. In its sixth season, John Oliver's Last Week Tonight has received numerous awards and reviews for its in-depth examination of a new story of the week. Oliver never fails to spice up his reporting with a five-minute dance number, a Guinness World Record of the largest sheet cake, or buying an absurd number of wax statues. But his style of reporting and dedication to his topics encapsulates his audience. He oftentimes goes to extreme lengths to find information to be the basis of his jokes, but yet he does not consider himself a journalist. With many others in this field, including Trevor Noah's The Daily Show, does comedic reporting count as journalism even if the hosts themselves do not believe to be? Yeah, what John Oliver does, I would consider journalism. He really brings attention to a lot of very important stories, uh, and he doesn't really care what exactly he says, so, you know, that's caused him to get hit with some lawsuits. But, you know, at the same time, it really brings a very refreshing uh, perspective from the media to everybody, to consumers, because they get kind of that information that a lot of other news agencies and media outlets aren't willing to talk about. So I don't necessarily consider comedic reporters to be journalists, but I do consider that the researchers and the writers who write their scripts to be journalists. And I think it's important to note the ghostwriting that goes on in journalism. In the last few years, we've seen a lot come up about ghostwriting within the music industry. And I think it's important to note that there is ghostwriting going on in journalism as well. And that the people who are writing the scripts and the people who are doing the research and coming up with the stories, those are the true journalists. But people that, um, such as John Oliver and Trevor Noah, they're more of actors and they're playing the role that society wants to see them in. I think it's very dangerous to consider uh, comedic reporting as journalism. To your point, Lucas, you said um, he do Oliver doesn't really care what he says. And that can be a problem because, you know, journalists, journalists follow rules. Um, they've been really hounded lately for the way they've been reporting things. And comedic reporters, they bring really good points and they bring light to very important issues, but they do it in ways that can seem biased, in ways uh, that increase, that I think could increase the stereotypes against journalists today, give uh, Trump and Trump supporters more ammunition to fire at journalists if we consider these people to be journalists. So I'm not saying what they do is not important in the journalism community, but I personally do not want to see them considered as journalists because I think it can hurt the profession. I would agree with that, but I would also bring up the point that maybe we should consider John Oliver as an op-ed kind of journalist because he does have that bias in his videos and he does have that bias about what he's talking about and how he's talking about it. So maybe instead of seeing him as a reporter or his writers as reporters, we could see them as like op-ed kind of writers. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Uh, both of you, I agree with both those points. Seeing, talking about him as a journalist, you're right. He doesn't follow the same code of ethics and the, have the unbiased um, approach that journalists should take, uh, whether they do or not. That's kind of up for debate. But no, what he does, I do think, is important in that journalistic community, and he brings light to a lot of very important issues. Going off that, I think Oliver makes the news very digest digestible and easy to understand. And though it may not necessarily be journalism, I think it has a crucial role in today's society where people are starting to get annoyed by some of the traditional media outlets and maybe like the pundits. Um, so it kind of brings a fresh perspective that I think is super important to talk about. I would agree with that. I think the style of comedy that he has in his videos is making it easier for people to pay attention to it because if the news is on and somebody's watching the news, they can be like doing something else at the same time and look up and kind of get things. But with John Oliver, since it's kind of like an SNL-esque looking at it and like digesting it, understanding it because it's pretty simplified, that he is getting a point across that traditional news outlets cannot. And I definitely think because of that comedic um, outlet, it definitely captures, I'd say, a lot more attention. Because as you said, like people could have the news on in the background. But if you sit down to watch John Oliver, you're sitting down to watch all of that information. And by the end, while it is comedic, you still learn something from it. And like that can still leave you with something. Okay, moving on. Um, 
In early October, a writer for Vogue experienced backlash after not preparing questions for her interview with Rihanna. Journalist Abby Aguirre said in the interview she didn't have time to prepare questions for the popular musician and businesswoman, and people quickly called out her unprofessional behavior. Aguirre was really transparent about what happened. Do you think that opened her up for a lot of criticism? Yeah, I, I do. I think, yeah, I, as much as I respect her for being transparent, I think going, you know, into the public and admitting I wasn't prepared to ask Brianna, you know, one of the biggest names in the entertainment industry, I wasn't prepared to go in there and ask her the questions and get the answers that we all want, that we all want, you know, that, that she went in there looking for. I think that definitely opened her up to criticism. I would agree with that, and while transparency is definitely important in the journalism industry, I think there becomes a point between transparency and between just ratting on yourself, because there was no need, like, the, our, her audiences would not have known that she didn't go in with prepared questions, and ultimately, not going in with prepared questions didn't destroy her work and destroy her article. She still produced good content and content that was um, highly favored, so I don't think there was necessarily any reason for her to open that up and take that. I think she used the transparency as a crutch to kind of hide. Maybe she was insecure about talking to someone who was as popular and famous as Rihanna. So she wanted to kind of, if she didn't think her story lived up to it, I think she kind of wanted to have that crutch to lean on and say like, well, maybe I wasn't prepared. That's why my questions or my interview didn't go as well. But then on the other hand of that, a celebrity interview versus an actual interview, would this being unprepared, this unprofessionalism, would this be okay in like a regular news story say for the New York Times or Washington Post if somebody if a reporter for either of those companies were transparent about the fact that they were not ready so I think it would have probably less backlash in the public um, not but I do I think it would actually be worse so in this story Rihanna actually came out and publicly um, publicly said that there was no fault to Aguirre, said that she was called up last minute, she got on a plane, went and met her, had no time to prepare a question. So as far as I'm concerned, the effort was there with Rihanna. She just actually, she actually had no time to prepare those questions, probably prepared them in her head as she was like getting on, either in the car or on the plane to meet Rihanna. But with a regular, like less famous person, I feel if you're showing up to one of those interviews where you know that it's going to be, they're probably not going to like, because if they say last minute, oh, I'm going to be here, you're most likely not going, like it's not Rihanna, so you're not going to have that pressure. And if you're still not prepared, that's saying, um, that's being extremely unprofessional because it's like this person isn't important enough for me to prepare my questions. Because obviously that's not why she didn't prepare them, prepare them for Rihanna. She was just on a huge time crunch. But if you don't prepare them for your everyday kind of stories, your stories with actual people, that's just saying this person isn't important enough for me to be prepared to ask them these questions. And I think that's a huge issue. Yeah, I'd agree that it's situational. It depends on, on the time that you have to prepare. If you don't have time to prepare, prepare uh, it's one thing and if it turns out fine it's great but if you do have time to prepare and you don't you know that's that's another issue Well, moving on, on November 5th, Project Veritas, a right-wing activist group, released a video of ABC News anchor Amy Rohrbach saying she had the Jeffrey Epstein sex scandal story three years ago, but ABC would not let it run. The clip was filmed with Rohrbach on a hot mic, meaning every producer could hear what she was saying, even though she was not on air. The video was leaked by someone claiming to work for CBS. This led to the firing of CBS and former ABC producer Ashley Bianco, who ABC identified as the leak. Bianco denies these claims, and many now, ABC included, believe the leaker is still out there and working for the company. However, despite the gravity and continuous updates in this story, it does not seem to be getting the media attention it deserves. Which brings on the question, what factors are keeping the developments of this story under so much wraps? I think the biggest thing is the fact that ABC will not address the issue and instead are looking for the whistleblower and hypothesizing about the fact that their alias was a Harry, Harry Potter reference instead of addressing the problem, finding out how to fix it, talking to the public about it, and getting their truth out there. I think another reason that we're not seeing a lot of coverage of this particular story in the media is the fact that ABC and CBS are both major names in the news, and they don't want this to come back and bite mm -hmm. them in the butt. They don't want to see that someone who worked for them was a leak, or they, they just don't want to see that, so they don't want to talk about it until they have all the facts, they have the whole story, they have all the news, and they can put it together in a way that doesn't hurt them. Yeah, and moving on to the credibility of Project Veritas, I think is, is what, you, uh, what you called that right-wing organization. 
I mean, you know, just off of their accusation, there's no, there's not much credibility there. <laughs> you would need to to see the recording or to just just get a different source to fact check this information. You know, going out and and firing this this person off of their word is definitely an over. It's it's, it's definitely not the right move. I agree with that. And I would argue that that's kind of the reason why we're not seeing a lot of public reaction to this story is because there aren't credible big news sources reporting on it. And instead, smaller news sources like Project Veritas that maybe aren't as credible or are more biased that are reporting on it. So people, A, don't believe it, and B, don't really care or see it. So what do, what do you all think about the firing of Bianco, the <laughs> producer who ABC identified, who is now actually likely to sue ABC for defamation and CBS for firing without a cause? Well, it definitely seemed like ABC did not have a strong cause from what she said, and I've read in the news that there was not a strong cause for it. I think that they, ABC really just wanted to like say they fired somebody to like say that they're on top of it, um, but obviously I don't think that they put enough time and effort into really looking into it, and I think that's backfiring on them, and I also think that's why they have not really mentioned much about the situation yet. Yeah, I think she should sue them. If they fired her for, if they fired her for a reason that, you know, for something that she didn't do, or for not having, you know, the correct information on this, uh, it's definitely something that she should look into because they were in the wrong. I mean, they're in the wrong here. I also think it's important to note that by being fired from this, uh, from her position, not only does this affect her current career, but it mm -hmm. affects any uh, future career she can and will have. Yeah, an important note about Bianco, uh, she was fired because ABC found that she had clipped the initial uh, video <coughs> to the ABC computers. Um, so that's just why they, that is why they, identified her as the leak because they saw that she had clipped it, but they had no evidence that she released it, and Bianco claims she just saved it to the system um, because she thought it was interesting and never disseminated it. Yeah, and going along with that, as I said before, ABC is taking way too much time in trying to figure out who did it and not how to fix it. So they're taking steps to fire people and to cover their tracks instead of, like, apologizing or figuring what, out what happened or taking any of those steps to address their mistake. Yeah, and in the overall, in the bigger overall picture, that's, I think, a problem that we're seeing with a lot of companies. You know, a lot of companies have an employee who, who does something wrong, and then they go ahead and fire that employee. You know, whether that employee, whether, like in this case, we don't even know if Bianca is the person who, who did this. You know, and sometimes they'll fire the right employee, but sometimes they'll fire the wrong employee. And then instead of taking the necessary steps to fix their company as a whole, they're like, well, this person's gone, so our problem's fixed. And so that could be a big reason why it keeps happening. All right, moving on to the next topic. So the work of citizen journalists has become very popular with the use of tel telephones and social media, but many professional journalists believe that they don't have the training and experience to accurately cover stories. The Documenteers program hopes to change that and bolster coverage of state and local government meetings that might not otherwise have a reporter there with the changing times. It's currently running in Chicago and Detroit and is looking to expand to Denver all with the goal of trying to create a more informed public. Do you guys think that the program seems like a viable alternative to traditional media coverage of the government? I personally love this program because whether this program is here or not, people are going to be tweeting news that aren't journalists. And the biggest issue with citizen journalism is <coughs> people can post whatever they want, spreading uh, falsehoods that harm people's reputations, form people's opinions on things that just aren't true. And so, in my opinion, trying to get these everyday people who aren't journalists and training them so that the more more content by these people on Twitter is real and factual, I think is a really good thing because it just increases the dissemination of, or it decreases, that is, the dissemination of false information by these people because you see it like things blow up on Twitter all the time, have 100,000 favorites, and they're just not true. And so I think by getting more people to, um, to follow these guidelines, you know, every every person counts, and I think the um, it can make like starting now, like it's a small difference, and then the more people they get into this program, the more it will help um, 
dissemination of factual news. I totally agree because another um, note about this program is that these citizens are being paid to do the program. Um, so I definitely think that helps in kind of retaining people and training them if they have an incentive for their work and that it's going to be used and important. I think that'll really make people take their job seriously and really help expand the program to different cities and more people. So more people are getting the information that they need to that's affecting their local government. Yeah, and more on that point, Citi- like what Bradley said, citizens are journalists already. You know, whether whether we want to admit that or not, they're going out and they're posting news, like what journalists do, just without any training. So getting any form of training, training to help them be less biased, training to help them, uh, training to help them just know how to post this information correctly and how to uh, make sure you get the accurate details out there, how, how to make sure it's not fake news, you know, that could go a very, very long way in ensuring that you know, these these fake news campaigns and the 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 posts that blow up that just aren't true, that can go a long way to ending that and, and ending alternative facts potentially just overall. You know, and another point that I love about citizen journalists is because trained journalists, professional journalists are they're not everywhere all the time. Whereas normal people are, citizens are. And so if we have these citizen journalists who go out and cover stories, you know, we can cover more. We can get more of this information out there for people, you know, and because everybody, somebody out there cares about every story. And so, you know, we can kind of connect more people to the media. And so that leads to another question. Will citizen journalists kind of help bring the media industry back, help people read more news, read more newspapers? Um, I think I think a program like this will definitely help bring the media back and get people back into um, f- focusing on especially government um, by do, by by having a program like this you're really opening it up to have more of a watchdog society and I think in the time that we currently live having a watchdog society is so crucial to see not only that the people we elect in government are doing what we think they're doing but more so that we know like why their intentions are what they're doing and by having everyday people out there and acting as watchdogs I think it elevates the journalism industry to a higher degree. And I think, like on like a slightly different note, something that we've talked about both in class, and I think has been on views in these news deserts. Like especially, this will help a lot with that because hopefully it'll move not just from like Chicago and Denver, but eventually can start be putting into place of like smaller places too. Because yeah, then you can start having more coverage, and that helps combat that problem that we see happening um, in mel- multiple like small towns all over the United States and other places. I would agree with that, but I also think it's important to take a step back and look at why people are wanting to be citizen journalists. What are their motivations for posting this story? Like you said, Lucas, they might care about it, but do they care about it for their own personal gain? Do they care about it for their own political bias, et cetera? Like all these things playing into why they would want to put that like picture up on Twitter or something. Why do they want to do that? And is that bias going to be checked in this program? Um, there actually is a, a play, person who's called a civic reporter. So they kind of check their findings and stuff and put it into a collective feedback. So they're really trying to take actions against that kind of happening. Yeah, that's where that training comes into effect. You know, training these citizens. It's not going to be, you know, a journalism degree. It's not going to be that in depth, but it'll be something. It'll help them uh, make sure to post accurate information and unbiased information, hopefully, which could, you know, end alternative facts, you know, could could put a stop to all this fake news going around that's been such a hot topic over the last several years. I would agree with that. But what does this also mean for people who get a degree in journalism or people who actually take the time to go to like a university instead of just a training program? Where does it differentiate between citizen journalists and trained journalists with a degree? And will citizen journalists be hired or will trained journalists be hired and where is that line going to be drawn i mean you know there's no there's nothing's going to make up for a degree new york times is not going to hire a citizen journalist so you know the more the more accredited media outlets are going to be still hiring those you know those those journalists with a diploma or you know just ones that that really know what they're doing you know because because there are journalists out there who don't have degrees uh and so it's not going to Affect, it's not going to affect it all that much in that regard. Um, but yeah, I mean, especially with the smaller newspapers, it could definitely bring an end to them. All right, switching gears a little bit. In 2016, Chanel Miller attended a party at Stanford University. Later that night, she found herself in a situation all women fear. 
She was unconscious and had been raped behind a dumpster by Brock Turner. We didn't know her name until just recently. All the public knew was that Brock Turner was a three-time All-American swimmer at Stanford and that he had a bright future and had just made a mistake. The world didn't know that Chanel Miller was passionate about art and that she too had a bright future. This particular story is not an outlier, however. Women of victims are continually framed with the blame on them. Their futures and their accolades are removed from the story. Due to this culture that has in part been created by the media, we have witnessed a rise in victim impact statements. Statements from the victim reclaiming their lives and their justice through public statements. We should not live in a culture where the due diligence of receiving justice after sexual violence is placed on the victim. How does the media move forward in a very hashtag me too world to to respect the victim's right to privacy while also reminding the world that the victim is indeed a person, just as the attacker. For this, I'm going to pick on a uh, New York Post article a little bit that came out after Brock Turner uh, was convicted of, of the uh, assault. And the headline, like you, like you mentioned, was three-time All-American swimmer. And in the article, it had very little details about the actual assault. It just said that all it said that got uh, brought them together was they were both at a party and then it named all of the number of drinks that she drank and then gave no details about the actual assault or the connection did not mention the two swiss men who actually f saw uh, witnessed it and fought him and held him there um, so the only connection that brought them together in the story was that they were both there brock turner was a three-time all-american swimmer and then chanel miller who was unnamed had had for vodka cranberries, I can't remember the exact, but they like named out every single drink she had just to say that she was drunk. And so what that story did was it told the viewer that she was being careless, that all we know is that Brock Turner is at the party, which wasn't true, and that he was a Stanford All-American swimmer. And I find that very prob problematic. What they should have done without, in a way to like keep from violating, like still don't use the name, but they should say, give details about the assault so that people can see what he did. They should say that these two Swiss men found him like assaulting her behind a dumpster at a party while she was blackout. That that way the public can see what he did. So it's they're less likely to sympathize with him because that article along with many others uh, made a huge like culture of uh, sympathizing with the attacker. Um, and we saw that in the news, you know, there was a ton of sympathizers for Brock Turner, like saying that he, oh, he didn't do this or it's been blown out of proportion when there was literally two witnesses to it that were not mentioned in a lot of pieces. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think what Chanel Miller is doing by writing her own book and telling her own story is taking like huge leaps for victims. So instead of letting other people tell your story and tell it in such a light that it paints the attacker as the good guy, they are instead taking it into their own hands and taking that story into their own hands so people can't manipulate their own story and they can get their facts out there. And I feel like, especially by how long, like this happened in 2016, her book was recently released this fall, but um, there has to come a point when on like the reporting side of it with like the headlines where that's how we stop, we stop identifying the victims by their attacker, because in in um, an article by Liza Ko, she interviewed uh, Chanel Miller, or it was from her book. I can't quite remember, but she was like, "I am not Brock Turner's anything," and that is very important that um, we remember that too. Is that there comes a point where we need to stop identifying them by their attackers and focus more on them as well. All right. Well, this has been great. Back to you, Amy. Aren't they great? I hope you have enjoyed their discussion as much as I have. A couple of people to thank for this special edition of Views of the News. RJI's Travis McMillan helped me to direct and produce today's program. Aaron Hay handled the audio for us, and Tim Pilcher composed our original theme music. Thanks for sticking with us. We'll see you next time.